So welcome everyone to what might well be our last perspective series lecture this semester. Um, we have with us today Mita Mastani, who is going to talk to us about breaking patterns, block printing, and creating life. For those of us who are new to this or who have forgotten, the perspective lecture series is trying to introduce us to ideas in the arts, the social sciences, and science so that we are tempted to learn some more, figure out some more, do something new with ourselves whenever we have the time to. So uh, welcome, everybody. And as usual, I am going to do this really tricky business of going through the introduction. Um, Mita Mastani is an internationally known print and natural dye artist and community development advocate. She works at the intersection of sustainable development, culture, craft, design, arts, and retail, expressing herself through different media and helping to generate livelihoods for marginalized communities. She travels India working with artisans in the area of textiles, folk art, art sorry, paper, leather, and wood. She has done collaborative work in different parts of the world and has taught as artist in residence in the US. She has also co-taught co printing and dyeing in natural colors uh, in Maine. Since co-founding the art and craft-centered sustainable business Bindas Unlimited, she has focused on reinterpreting traditional craft and art for urban and international markets. She lives part of the year in rural Rajasthan, where she creates contemporary block prints on textiles and t-shirts with traditional printer communities, reviving and expanding the natural dyeing traditions and creating new designs and techniques. Her art has also been displayed in a variety of places, among them the Fabric of India at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Craft and Costume, uh, the Fermentation Fest, uh, Madison Children's Museum, the Dutch Costume Museum in Amsterdam, and so forth. So as usual, I will request Mita Mastani to provide some more of an introduction to herself because these introductions are usually too brief and flimsy to give us an idea of who the person is, but by the end of the lecture, I'm sure will be better. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Is this a good volume? Hi, everyone. I'm going to start with a small film on my work. My name is Meeta. My brand is called Bindas Unlimited. I started with a bunch of friends in the early 90s. I work like with many different skills, printing, dyeing, handmade paper, metal, wood. But most extensively in textiles. I work with many different rural communities and my work with them is my window into rural India and their window into urban India. सफाई का काम होता है छिपा समाज का जब से बिंदास वाले आए उसके बाद से इन्होंने डिजाइनिंग वगैरह चेंज की और की तो उसके बाद से चेंज हुआ इससे पहले वो ट्रेडिशनल ही चलता था I collaborate with traditional rural artisans and together we contemporize traditional skills and make it relevant to now इस काम में जो मजा आता है उसका सबसे इंटरेस्टिंग पार्ट होता है नई नई कलर्स डेवलप करना नई डिजाइन डेवलप करना the work I do is hand printing and natural dyeing on natural fabrics of different kinds. We extract colors right from the dye stuffs. We don't use ready-made dyes of any kind. It's a crazy thing to be doing it. Not many people do it, uh, especially not in the quantities that we work on. We work on fairly large quantities. It is actually a labor of love. So I design some of the blocks and other people, other designers design the blocks as well. But what I do is I tell stories with these blocks. So each of my saris, t-shirts, stoles, towels, whatever, they have a story behind them. 
I'm inspired by the folk tradition of India, which is very playful and irreverent, and that reflects in my work. Since each piece is made by hand, they are all unique. And if you look at it from an industrial perspective, they are not going to look as well finished and perfect. But for me, that imperfection is actually what makes it unique and beautiful. It's been a long journey and the exciting thing is that there's more to come. I didn't want you to introduce myself several times over the same way, but I guess that's what's happening. Okay, here we go. I need help. Is this what I want? This is yeah, what you want. perfect. And yeah, okay. Okay, so hello everyone. And as was there in the film that my brand is called Bindas Unlimited. I work with rural artisans and one of my key collaborators are a rural studio in a village in Rajasthan called Chobundi and I help contemporize prints. They teach me what they know and I teach them what I know and we sort of learn together, stumble along and learn together. Uh, I want to start with patterns. Can anybody tell me what is a pattern? <laughs> Come on, you're all design up. What is a pattern? You can do it. Batao, batao. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Anything that repeats. And it can be a decorative pattern. It can be a way of doing something. It can be our walk. It can be the cadence of our talk. It can be a relationship. So I like seeing patterns in whatever, in things. And I also like breaking them and seeing new patterns, because whatever we do, it is a pattern. It, it starts over into a new one, and then you start over again. Uh, this. So how many of you use Instagram? And do any of you have that app, that layout? OK, can you fire it up? And I want you to take a selfie of anything. You decide what is a selfie. Is it your face? Is it your hands? Is it your feet? And just see if you can create a pattern with that on your phone. Now, can you do that now? <laughs> like in the next two or three minutes. Have you, has any of you used it before? Okay. So if you haven't, it's really fun because it helps you make all kinds of patterns. We have two minutes for this. It has tools to actually break the pattern too. You can mirror, you can flip, you can do all kinds of things in it. You can insert another photograph and change that pattern as well. <laughs> Has anyone done it? Is anybody done? What about you? Oh, yeah. No. Fast, fast. Oh, have you, you haven't taken a photo yet. I saw it. Oh, OK. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So if you'd like to hashtag it and use it. I mean, you can, like I'm saying, you can just play with the patterns and break them, change them around. Everyone done? Anyone done? Other than these two? 
Nice. Any more? Nobody else has finished? Okay. Yeah, okay. It's not a, you're not getting graded on this. It's not an assignment. <laughs> we can move, we can move on. Okay, so basically there's no, okay, now we can come back. Not that easy, but we'll come back. There's no name, one name for what I do. You know, it's not, a, there's not a simple title. And I like very much that I can bring all the things I enjoy into my work together. I'm a production person, I'm a designer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm an accountant, I'm all of those things. And I bring all those aspects together into my work. And I've learned that the more things I incorporate in my work, the better I do them. Um, I design prints around the things I enjoy, like music, food, uh, nature, and I create and sell tens of thousands of meters of fabric. Um, all kind, I make textile art, everything which is contemporary and hand printed. I make single pieces of uh, so-called art for my own pleasure and for museum shows, and I make. Uh, replicates, like many of one kind, many meters of one kind, many saris, many all kinds of different fabrics for sale. And all of you are studying a particular profession, whatever that profession may be. And I really encourage you to bring all your interests to that profession because there are many designers, millions of designers, millions of architects, but the unique you that's there with the skills that you have, with what you learn and your interests, is the specialty that you can bring to your work. Um, over the last 25 years, I have run a self-funded ethical art practice and a business, and I've used it as an opportunity to work with people that I enjoy. I've built it up little by little and consciously kept it affordable uh, so that it can be accessible to more people and so that I can provide more employment which means I need to produce a lot more work and that I enjoy that creation of the new designs and the craziness that goes with production. I don't know how many of you have worked on production of any kind. Anything that can go wrong does. And it's interesting to pro find the, you know, overcome those challenges and come up with something that you enjoy yourself. Uh, my collaborators have been other artists, the artisans, of course, retailers. And an important part of my work has been to get recognition for the artisans that I work with. Uh, when I started working with them in the 90s, they were mostly um, considered almost to be like technicians, which of course they are not. They are very skilled artists in their own way. They do things that I could not, you know, I could not dream of doing in the time that they do and given the constraints that they have. And I've learned their traditional skills thanks to their generosity and I've created my own work and I've helped them contemporize their work. When I started working with them, I started working with this, just a minute. Yeah, I got it, thank you. With this group called Chobundi, like I said, their turnover was about 50,000 rupees a year. This was in 93. Uh, now their turnover is over a crore of rupees and we, um, they provide employment. Together we work with a, between 30 to 80 people depending on the time of the year, depending on how many orders we have and you know, whatever is going on at the time. And textiles account for about 5% of India's GDP. Uh, it's actually our first original startups, you know, way before the tech startups. So the idea was, when I started out, the idea was to create things of beauty and share credit with the craftspeople. India is a really old civilization, but a very young country. It's only 70 some years, right? So when we, st when we started this work, um, we didn't have that confidence in Indian design. It's been 25 years and things have changed a lot. But uh, there were still mostly things from outside the country which were considered you know, that's what's good in design. Uh, we were a group of designers, retailers, community workers, and everybody brought whatever skills they had and we pooled them together. We consciously created and adopted an Indian design aesthetics with images of things that we see around us. 
Um, I like a curry or a paisley as much as the other next person but i also want to see new things i love the way tradition has played with it and changed it around but i also want to see new images so this is one of the images traditional prints of kaladera village where i work is called chobundi and until about 50 years back these traditional prints were social markers so in a country with very strong uh, rules social rules uh, and I think pretty much anywhere in every part of the world, dress and costume has always been about identifying who comes from where. So if you saw somebody wearing this, you'd know which community they came from. If you knew a little more, you would know which, who has printed this. You'd know where it was printed. There was this informal kind of copyright system, and every village printed about a few prints, maybe three, five, seven prints, and no more. And there was nobody monitoring and saying, you can't do this. But there was a much stronger community. And people did not, one village did not print the prints of another village. And now, of course, it's all different. Everybody prints everything. We wear everything. People uh, in, from one state are doing this craft from another state. We like to learn origami. We like to learn things from all parts of the world. And why not uh, people from these communities as well? Here's another, whoops. Here's another traditional print called uh, Dhania, also from the same village. Uh, this is uh, one of my prints. If any of you have heard of Fez, Ahmed Fez, this is from a poem of his which says, Bol ki labazad hai tere. And uh, I like very much using poetry in my work. Can anybody identify the pattern down the middle? Mangoes. Mangoes, yeah. And on the side are these achar, barni sort of boxes of achar. That's a stole. This is my version of a traffic jam in Delhi where there's a lot of them. You can see the auto rickshaw there. Here, uh, she's wearing so many different kinds of saris, from the cycle to the coin that I'm wearing, uh, to the one in the middle, the pink. The one in pink is actually a crow dipping its beak into an anar flower. Then there's deer, there's flowers. They're all things that are visible around right there. This is a, I work on t-shirts, fabric, stoles, saris, all kinds of media. And uh, this is, can anybody identify the, you know, what it says in the main body? Yeah, TV. And the one below, this, does it remind you of anything? Yeah, so it is the barcode written in Hindi. And that for me is what happens when we see a lot of TV. You end up buying a lot of stuff. These are dice, slightly loaded dice. It's that same achar. And on top is the, you know, the old kind of razor blades. This is the ambassador. This is part of the handmade paper stuff. Uh, I work with paper makers as well. Can anybody read this, what's written in this? Yeah, it's a song. It's that song, Zindagi Kaisi Hai Paheli Hai. And the image also is in the form of a maze. So you know we are Indian and everything, elephant. So this is like the, a contemporary version of it. It's done, actually done by a child. And it's the elephant bum. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to take you through one, just one block and how I, there are a million ways to design a pattern and this is the way I did this one. That's, I started with my hand and taking a photograph and then I actually just drew it on a piece of paper with the outline. I wrote, as you can see on top, in, in pencil and then inked it in. And put the two together. And then I don't have an image of the block, but then that's how it looks like printed in ink on the t-shirt. So usually a pattern is uh, the, a good printer is considered somebody who makes, who prints a pattern in such a way that it fits, it fits so well that you can't see where the, where it's joining. It's that, that's the mark of somebody who's a really good printer. Um, like I said, I like to break patterns and I wanted to work on, say, a t-shirt or a scarf and it's not going to be that running pattern. It can be, but it cannot be as well. So this is a single, the block is just a single tree and it's repeated. And here's a leaf, a people leaf, and this is also a single block and, you know, it started shifting, moving around, playing with it. Okay, so here's a leaf which the printer has played with and moved. And you'd be surprised because for so many years they are used to printing it in the you know, in a repeat, in a way that it doesn't show, that for this is far more difficult for them to do than to do the straight off repeat. And uh, now the people, the, it's a particular family that I work with and the people who, the printers who work with them are now really well known in the village for being able to do the regular stuff and to be able to do, to break the pattern as well. And they've realized that that is a skill and they are now called, print can you come and help me type of thing. So this is a t-shirt that I did in collaboration with People Tree, uh, which is a design company in Delhi. And uh, it was shown at the VNA in London as part of a show. And it has a really funny story. So we printed this many years back and uh, somebody came and bought it from their store and they wanted to duplicate it. So they wanted to copy it and export it without giving any credit or asking us to do it, of course. It's a very small community, not everybody knows everyone else, so it came to the house nearby. They came to the people I work with and they said, no, we're not going to do this, you go somewhere else. So they went to the house nearby and uh, that person actually called me and said, just aake dekho kya ho raha. it was really funny. The printer, so you can see that the, uh, there's bits of the tiger, just the front, the tail, and we do this by a very sophisticated mechanism, and I'm gonna show you that. And that's this wonderful piece of paper which is used as a masking device. So you put, a little bit of the tiger here. And of course, every t-shirt is different because, you know, sometimes kabhi haat idhar dalega, kabhi idhar dalega. But these guys wanted to export and they wanted few thousand t-shirts looking exactly the same. So they made, let me go back. They made about eight images of the tiger. Just this, just this, a little bit of the tail, a little. They made eight different blocks. And you cannot print one one piece with it. I mean, you can do it, but it'll take a long time, not at the prices we are working at. It certainly can't be done in that much time. So uh, they ended up screen printing it because there was no way they could block print it. So one thing that I really enjoy about the work I do is that each piece is different. It's unique. It's not cookie cutter. It's not from a factory. And um, I like that it's different. I don't feel the need for it to look exactly the same. Uh, these are a bunch of different t-shirts. 
the one on the top, what is that, left? Uh, is that print from Piazza? Do you know the, the film Piazza? I don't know if you can see it, but that's the image there. Then there's, of course, the ocean. There are these chapels and feet. Uh, Mirchi. I mean, you can look. There's just a bunch of different patterns. I like a lot of text stuff like this. This is uh, from Kabir, that Dhai Akhar Prem Ke Padhe Supandit Hoye. In this, we've used uh, one, two, three, four, maybe five different blocks to create this image. And again, that same very fancy equipment of a piece of paper which you use to block it and you know, show parts of the block and remove parts of the block. I work with a lot of different NGOs and uh, so this is in collaboration with an agency called Karam Marg. Uh, it's a home for street children in Faridabad outside of Delhi. And uh, the women who live around that village, they, whatever fabrics I make, every little inch of that goes to whatever's left over on the sides of the garments that's made. The bits of the fabric that are left over go to this agency and they make these bags out of those. And then those bags are sold and they raise funds for the home where about 60 kids live and grow up. This is another such agency working with the women who are HIV positive and who have been abandoned by their families. This is in Tamil Nadu called Blue Mango Trust. So they make these really beautiful stuffed toys. This is a company called Happily Unmarried, and uh, I've done a bunch of stuff with them. They're friends. It's really nice if you work in collaboration. It's really fun because you can get to make fun relationships through your work as well, which is what I've always done. It's tricky. It's difficult, but it's, it can be a lot of fun. <clears throat> This is what a block looks like, the outline of the block, and the one on top is the filler. Uh, this, the one, the outline is called the rake, and the filler is called the datta. And the filler is usually used uh, with the mud resist, which is the specialty of this area. The mud resist takes a long, I mean, it's difficult to make. It's made out of clay from the bottom of a river. It has wheat, the leftover of eaten up wheat by a specific bug, and ironically now, that's called bidan, and ironically now that is more expensive than buying wheat. Uh, it has tree gum, it has chuna, lime, limestone, and then it's mixed together in large quantities. You make about 50 or 100 kilos at a time and use it as a resist. Because it's a washable resist, it has certain benefits. But because it's washable, we also can't use it with a hot dye, unlike batik, like wax. Uh, but so these are the, this is just generally what a block looks like. This is what the printed block would look like. The outline is in black. Uh, the filler is, is with the resist, and then it's tied in an indigo. <coughs> so. This is how usually mud resist was used, to mask a particular area and to highlight that area, not just it's masking it, but at the same time it's also highlighting the body of the woman, right? Uh, I didn't come from a traditional, I don't have a design training, I don't have training in design. I don't come from a traditional uh, printer's family, so I didn't know what was the right way to do things and neither did the people I worked with. So we actually innovated and used two different, um, like I said, everything that can go wrong goes wrong in this process. We've had a uh, bird, little bird, fall into the printing ink and walk all over the fabric, so mucked it up that way. There are pigs in the village, there are dogs. That Earlier we didn't have access to a field, so the stuff would dry on the road and the tractors would go over it, people would walk all over it. And it used to be really funny because at the time I used to work on silks and in these, on these saris. And 
It was amazing how it was made. It was lying on the street, people are walking on it, tractors are rolling over it, dogs are walking over it. And the minute you, you're done and you wash it and you calendar it, which means you kind of iron it out and put it on wherever you are going to sell it, then people say, Acha, dry clean only. <laughs> and, yeah, okay, dry clean only, whatever. But, um, uh, so to come back to this, because everything, like I said, can and does go wrong, we tried out this method where we printed two kinds of dabu. This mud resist is called dabu, which are unrelated to each other, unlike this one, where it's specifically designed to fit into that block. So it was like this, which are absolutely unrelated to each other. If this thing ever moves, yeah, it's moved. And this is now, uh, this is about maybe 23 years old, this, this way of printing. And we actually sort of created it together. It's called Double Dabu now. It covers all the sins because in this area, the printers are not used to doing very fine quality printing. It's not like, you know, you have here in Gujarat, you have 16 colors and they do beautiful stuff. But we don't, we don't have those skills there. We have other skills. And it's uh, copied all over now, all over. Different printers use it. People in Madhya Pradesh use it. And it's double dabu kar rahe hai. So it's really nice to know that actually we've sort of started off something like this. This is what they look like from a distance when you do those kind of saris. Another one, you actually end up dyeing two colors and it looks like four because of the way it, there are places where you can see one color, where you can see both colors, none of the colors, all of that. So I'm going to take you through the process in a little detail now. Uh, the first one is the, of course, the making of the, first one is the designing of the block, which I already showed you one example of. You can draw it, you can do it many different ways. And once it's visualized and drawn on paper, then it's transferred onto wood and carved on the wood. If it's a text, it has to be done, I mean, if any of you are printmakers here, you'd know it has to be done reverse. You have to mirror it like you can in that. App. You have to reverse it because otherwise when you print it, it's going to be ulta. Then um, this alone, you know, there's a whole community of block makers and we've been working with a specific uh, group of them and it's a skill on its own. It's absolutely beautiful to see them work. The blocks earlier, I have old blocks which are very old. They still last. The newer blocks are usually made out of wood which is very kacha because the other wood is um, not that easily accessible anymore. And now if it's lying on the table and it falls, it can crack even immediately, you know, earlier. But, I, but I, like I said, I have 20-year-old blocks which are perfect. So to make sure that we, you hope and pray that the wood is seasoned, but it usually is not anymore because you need to keep it for that much time. To season wood, you need to keep it outdoors and let it be, uh, go through one rain, expand, contract, so that it can take all of that because we're going to be printing with liquids, right? And then we're going to put it into water, soak it in water over a long period of time so it's going to crack. It's easy for it to crack. So it's first soaked at least overnight, preferably longer, in oil. Uh, traditionally, you use the oil that has been used for, you know, kadhai, anything that you fried in the, in the house. They would use the, that oil and keep the blocks in it so that it will soak up the oil and then um, be able to take the expansion and contraction of the wood. The fabric comes in long lengths of uh, hundreds of meters. I don't work with uh, hand loom fabric. I work with power loom fabric because that's cheaper and I have to choose for the price purpose I need to do this. And so it's cut into lengths of about six meters each and then soaked overnight at least, again a little more. And then after soaking, it's there are these fillers that come in it and a starch, of course, mari is also put into it, so to remove that and so that it'll accept the dye well. 
then it's really beaten mercilessly by hand satte deke and then it's dried in the field once it's and it has to be dried in the sun it doesn't work if it's dried in the shade and it has to be dried not on a uh, paved surface it needs to be in the mud uh, then it is dyed with uh, harda which is terminalia chebula which is the provides the tannin for the um, you know like this black the black outline so that the black outline will stick to the fabric well this is called siahi it's they found fragments of uh, textiles exported out of india to fotstat in egypt and those fragments are 2000 years old they are of course you know chitras really small little pieces but the print is still intact it's that fast uh, it's made out of uh, iron and gur and water and it takes about a month to make this have have any of you visited any traditional printing communities here Oh, nice. Oh, same technique in Mahabali, yes. Except that they paint, right? Yeah. And so then you choose your blocks. Everybody has their bank of blocks, and you choose from those. And yes. Then you. They are printed on these long six-meter tables, so that earlier the tables were low. They were like little. patties you sat on the floor and you printed and they were small maybe 2 and a half feet by a feet and a half now these are made to take sarees so they are 6 meters long after it's printed it's left for a few days it's like in you know how in ajrak they say the the word comes from ajrak which means keep it today so at between every step you need to hang on to the fabric let it soak in not be in a hurry and we need the sun so uh it's kept definitely dried in the sun after printing kept for as much time as you have and then washed in this way uh after that after it's washed it's boiled in a copper vat uh with the uh, certain flowers and it's it's boiled for about 4 hours with dhavri flowers i don't know the english name for it in a copper vat and that makes the colors fast if there is a red print in it then it has uh, either alizarine or madder and it's printed in alum and that makes the red color come so this is also a long and very tedious process not many people do this it's much easier to just print in a red print and make it look like it is a natural print which often it isn't mm, it's then dried and now comes the process of mud resist so here she's printing with mud resist in the insides of those bottles after that again it's dried in the sun and uh, i mean the sun is crucial for this i actually did a small i did a two week module where i taught and i taught in a place where it was very uh, rainy and i realized boss there's a reason that it happens in a dry uh, very very sunny place and it it was very difficult because even we kept it indoors we put the fans on we put the heaters on but it's not the same as having the sun the way that there's something very amazing about it how it brings out the color it needs that particular kind of heat anyways after it's dried then it's dyed in this case it's being dyed in indigo and if any of you have seen indigo dyeing it comes out of the vat green and then when it oxidizes maybe in about 2 3 minutes it turns blue have any of you seen this the indigo dyeing okay nobody okay so then it's dried in the sun again you can see the mud resist on this right just the outlines and dried again it has to be dried on, on mitti it can't be dried on a paved surface it has to be the other way because it's never going to dry if it's on a surface which doesn't have which doesn't absorb the water because it's dripping water and especially when you're doing large quantities like you can have a sense of at a time when you die we would be doing a few hundred meters at in that day i 
I'm sorry, this is a bit slow, but uh, they are now washing. This is the washing being done. The feet are used to remove the mud resist. So all parts of the body, it's all hand done. It's done in these big vats, huge, um, not vats, they're called hod. It's like a, like a s small swimming pool kind of thing and it's just full of water and it's soaked for a long time and then washed. And every part of the process, the printer has a printing community who's skilled at this. The washing people, there's a community of washers who are skilled at this. The dyers used to be, earlier there used to be Nilgars who were from a particular community and they would do the dyeing. I have seen in my lifetime that shift from Nilgars to everybody doing the dyeing. But it's really interesting how these different communities needed to work with each other they could have caste rules, they could not eat in each other's homes, they could not attend each other's weddings, but they worked together. And there was a reason to connect and to go do your thing. So they knew each other as people in any case. This is after the washing. It's just going to show up. Uh, once it's washed, you can see the area that was had the mud resist is white and the area that didn't has been dying. Uh, you know, this is a connecting pattern we have in, in natural dyes. If you have the prints very far apart, then it's going to be blotchy. The dyes are not even. Unless you dye the yarn and weave the fabric, then you can get an even surface. But if you have, uh, I mean, even in this, you can see that there are some spots here and it's even elsewhere. So the way around that was like you, if you remember the first image that I started with that small close by uh, uh, pattern of the Chobundi, the idea of keeping the motifs very close together was to cover up this problem of the patchy dye. So if you keep it together and you break it, you don't see the patches that much and it's part of the whole way it looks. So in Rajasthan, there's a saying called Satvar no Tyohar, which means we have seven days of the week and nine festivals. So it's very difficult to find time to work. And one thing I really appreciate is that I have had a chance to uh, get to know rural India, which I wouldn't have otherwise because I don't have a rural home. Uh, how many of you have a, some village home, some nani, dadi, something? Ah, nice. So I didn't have that. This was my way of finding a rural home. And it's a whole different way of working and living and being, and much calmer than a city way. And I've really learned a lot. So anyway, so I have this uh, so many years. It's now my family. They are like my friends and family. And I have eaten some very yummy food. I've been a DJ and played the worst Hindi film music. All the stuff I swore I would never play, but I, I mean, there was no choice. I've met some very, very beautiful, very kick-ass, very strong women. And like I said, I have a rural family now. These are all the people I work with. These are some of the people I work with. This is just the uh, family who's home, who own the studio. Then there are the people who come to print, the people who dye, the people who do the washing, the calendaring. There's so many different elements. And like I said, in summer, in the monsoons, you have an enforced break for about three to four months. You have to. You have to listen to nature, you have to just take it easy, and you can experiment, you can try your dyes, you can chill, you can have pakoras in the rain, do whatever you like, but you can't really work at that time of the year. At the times, uh, now is a very crucial time. Everybody's gearing up with their production, they're making, getting ready. This is the time when they go for a lot of different exhibitions, you know, Diwali, Dasera. Uh, Navratri, all of that. So there's a lot of different melas on in different parts of the country. And um, 
everybody's making stuff for it because of course they couldn't do it before and they're sold out during the rains. Uh, so, like I said, between 30 to 80 people is what I work with in this. And um, it's, it's a whole different rhythm. It's like farming. You have to have a sense of humor, you have to have patience, and you just have to, you don't have to, what I've also learned for, through my work is not to have an end, like I want it to look like this, because it's not going to look like that. I, I don't take orders. Uh, from people uh, a particular design order unless they they are open to the fact that it may change I'm going to try and make it look like this but it's not necessary that it's going to end up looking like this it can look like something completely different we may need to do another dabu on it we may need to do something if the dye goes wrong and uh, because we're extracting the colors from natural uh, elements from flowers from leaves from roots. Uh, it depends on how, how old the plant is, when it was extracted, has it been dried properly. Uh, it depends on so many different things. So, I mean, I've learned to have less control is what I'm trying to say. And people who do this, they have, they know this lesson really well. If you do anything to do with nature, you don't have, I mean, even if you don't, we don't have control, but we like to believe that we do. And this, this really has taught me that there's no way we have that. So I also teach, right? And I um, was artist in residence for a semester at a university in the US. And I had uh, some students who I taught. They were from uh, first year students in college to PhD students and from science backgrounds, from arts backgrounds, all kinds of things. So my only mandate to them, I wanted them to make their prints very as political as they could. And it was really interesting what people thought of as politics. Uh, there were some people who worked with hair. There were some people who worked on women's stuff. You can see their flowers, but the stems are all kinds of labels that sh that particular girl heard, and she wanted to bring that out. This is the same print, but it's been dyed. So just to show you what it looks like after it's dyed. So they carved their own blocks. And Olivia's father runs a bakery. And she says that's how she has, that's how she's gotten the money to come to college. And for her, uh, that was her politics. She's, done wheat in the background, if you can see. I was really surprised. This was in the US. I was really surprised to see how many people found uh, uh, farming as a very political thing. And of course it is, but it hadn't struck me that it was. Okay, okay this is taking longer than usual. So here, again, somebody else who found farming. She's, her work was also on farming. This is more recent, this year in summer. Uh, So Penny worked on, you know, they have a minimum wage, which is different in every state. She's from the state of Wisconsin. So she made the map of Wisconsin with the border around it. And that was her block. And then she repeated it. And she actually made fabric out of it, sewed a shirt, and used that as part for the show. And wanted to talk about how the wage, the minimum wage, was actually an unlivable wage. It wasn't something that anybody can survive on. Yeah. So there's another dump Trump t-shirt. He's really popular as you can see. 
this was really interesting. I worked with a dancer and we, uh, they produced a dance show. We did, dra and I worked with them in draping. Uh, you know, we have many ways of draping fabric here, both for men and women. And we did uh, traditional drapes of different kinds. They used some of the textiles that I make here as part of their dance performance. And they actually used the textiles as a character in their dance. So they draped the stuff during the performance. And we used, uh, when I showed you the film on printing, there was that old Hindi film music playing in the background. And I had the sound of these of the printers printing. You know, that sound of the block repeating and this music playing in the background. And then each of the students made an artist uh, statement, which was a minute, you know, they read it out, and that was a minute long. And that artist statement with that music playing in the background and the print of, uh, the sound of the printing was the music we used for the performance. It was a 30 minute performance. It was really, really nice to have cross disciplinary, to create stuff, cross disciplinary. Uh, some of my work shows in museums in different parts of the world. So this is at the Seidersee in the Netherlands. It's a little outside of Amsterdam. And uh, it, this is with a Dutch artist. It was part of a project. Uh, India, we used to export a lot of chintz. Have any of you heard of this? Chintz or cheat? So this was one of our primary exports back in the days. And it went from Gujarat. It went from Andhra Pradesh went to different parts of the world, and the Dutch East India Company took it to the Netherlands. And so this was part of a project to bring together Dutch and Indian artists and designers. And we worked together, and we discussed the, f the piece in front is a sari blouse, and the piece at the back is a Dutch kruplup. So it's a, it sort of covers the dress. It sits on top of the dress. And as you can see, they are very similar. And we took the theme of, we, mm, both of us, Marley's and I had different themes, and mine was the neem. You can see the neem leaves at the back. For me, always the concept of uh, uh, neem, you know that chopal under the neem tree where people sit and talk, and it's totally out of context. People come and go, just, hi, how are you? Uh, pick up a conversation out of nowhere. So I really, that really works for me. And in the village where I live, it's a very integral part of our everyday life to sit there after khana see who's going by, chat with anybody. Uh, so this was part of one of the museum shows that I've done. And um, like I said, I like to bring together different interests in my work. And I believe that that really adds to whatever it is that we choose to do. Uh, this is part of the draping that we did. Uh, I was showing you different styles of draping the sari. These are all so-called formal styles, but you know that there's no really formal style. You can create your own, and in a while, that will be a formal style. So you'll, that's what I mean about making patterns. It, it gets a name, and it becomes formal. So what this style, this urban style that I'm wearing, and which you see most people, most women wearing, this is called the nivi. Uh, it was a style started by uh, Rabindranath Tagore's sister-in-law. And there are um, thousands of different styles, and you can make your own, and it's as valid as anything else. So I mean, it's just been a lot of fun, a very good journey to do different things and put them together into one, bring it together. And uh, it may not have a name, but uh, when I started working, it. Uh, I started working in 89, and I worked with an NGO to start with, and you know everybody thought, oh, she's crazy, how, what kind of work is she doing? There's no money, there's no, you have to go in buses, but it comes together, it, it comes into place. If you do what you like, if you enjoy what you like, and you do it, you'll do it well. And I'd be very happy to have here any questions that you guys have on the technical, on the anything. And no question is uh, stupid. No question is good. Just go ahead and ask.
Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. So initially they said, these are so funny. Who's going to buy this? Who wants to wear a sikka or who, you know, like a coin? Nobody, they are not beautiful. Sure, they are not beautiful. But uh, there is a, there are plenty of people who want to wear something which is funny, which is irre irreverent. Uh, now they themselves tell me, Achha, I'm keeping so many meters for myself. I want this for my shirt or, oh, I keep this for my so it took time, but uh, there's, a, there's a very strong sense of humor everywhere in the world. And in rural India also, it's very intact. It's very, it's, it's very on point. So they got it completely. They didn't know who would buy it. Initially, they were very skeptical. But then as they saw that there were sales and I was coming back to make more, they that worked itself out. Yes? Also good question. My main clientele is, um, so it started out by people who were young, who were, and now those same people who were young have become, so it's, it now stretches from, uh, my friends' kids who come to buy, to my friends who are 50s, 60s. They are urban people mostly. Uh, it's available online. It's available in stores. They are people who are confident and people who don't want to wear, uh, you know, s some, the same stuff that everyone's wearing. They are people who are not scared to stand out. And uh, there are people who like natural fabrics because I only work in cottons usually, sometimes linen, a little bit of silk, but mostly only cottons. Uh, so it's all kinds of people, men, women, anybody with a sense of humor, anybody with a sense of confidence, they wear it. Yes? Uh, putting powder on the print. So when we print with mud resist, it's gloopy. It's like a like a thick soup. If we pick it up, so the, it'll come on the fabric. It it'll smudge. So we use uh, sawdust, the powder of wood. It's put on top of the fabric, on top of that dabu, so that that soaks up the the humidity in the dabu. And then when you pick it up and you put it down to dry, it doesn't smudge. Bhoor bulate, but it's sawdust basically. So again, everything used is natural. The, the material to put it together, the printing trays, the bamboo on the printing tray, the wood is ma the blocks are made of wood. It's just all very rudimentary and basic, but it works well for them. The trays, the carts that are used to take the trays up and down are made of wood and they have these four wheels at the bottom. It's just very basic. And they are really skilled people. It's a very, it's a very evolved technique that they put together. Through this technique, they put together things which look very good and they, it's not many resources that you need for it. Or kuch, yeah? Uh, so yes. There were some? Yeah, good catch. So if we, they are called pavansars, holes for the air to go through. If we don't have those holes, then you can print this much fabric and there won't be a problem. But when you want to print five meters of it, the printing ink will fill into the grooves of the block. And then the impression that you put will again be smudged. So those holes prevent that from happening. They let, they, they are all the way through. They go from top all the way down to the bottom. And they prevent the printing paste from sticking to the block, sticking in between the lines of the block.
Yeah. Right. Yes. I don't work with chemical dyes, I work with natural dyes, but there's plus and minus on the side of that as well because uh, it takes much longer to do. The person doing it is then not, if you're paying the same amount, then the person doing it is getting less for their mehenat. Uh, it needs a lot more water and we, our forests are running out, so it's becoming more and more expensive. I believe that like everywhere else in the world, it's going to reduce and it, it's not going to, it's going to reduce in quantity and it's going to become a more expensive game. Like people who want to put in more money, only those people will be able to buy it. But uh, I don't use chemical. I don't, I love the way this looks. Uh, there are very few basic colors. There's indigo, there's uh, gray, which comes from kashish, which is a mineral. There's indigo used with green, which is from anar chilka which makes the green, the blue first, and then the yellow. Uh, there are some brown, which is from katha and chuna. So there are five, seven colors, and I love the way the combination, of, you know, you can't go wrong. You can mix any of these together, and it'll look really good. You don't, I don't want that infinite color palette. I want to reduce my options, and I want to work within it. And so far, I've been able to do it. Uh, but if you want, to, if you take orders, if you do all of that, it's not really possible to do it because something will go wrong. And one thing I really appreciate about this work is even if somebody's working in somebody else's house, they're printing. So if they have a visitor, they will just not show up for the day. So you can plan, you are in a hurry, you have an order, you have somebody, you know, you said you will give it in eight weeks, it's, where is it? Wo to ghar gaye. Wo to aaj nahi mein. Aaj to tiohar hai. Uski bahu whatever, just something happens and so life is even for me more important, even though I'm, I'm in trouble because I haven't given it when I said, I really believe that that is a healthier way to live and work. And, uh, but if you take those big orders, you want to do it fast, you want it yesterday, you can't, it's just not possible to do it. Uh, I do very little screen for the technique that Zindagi Kaisi Hai Paheli, that was a screen in Dabu. But 95% of my work is in block. Yes? Ma'am, what is the kind of uh, competition that you face in the market when it comes to selling your products? Yeah, really nice. So I'm terrible at selling my stuff. I love making it. I'm really awful. After 25 years, the first time I sold in my own name, uh, five years back online and now I went for one exhibition for the first time. I usually work through retailers. Competition would be, uh, so because the design language is so different, the one big competition would be the cheapas themselves, but they are not my competition. We've developed two different lines and theirs is distinctly different from what I make. So that is not, but people copy the stuff there's enough, there's no copyright here and if I'm going to spend my time chasing people in court cases then I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to work, right? Um, because of the way the prints are, there isn't too much competition. There are still people doing these kind of images but not much in natural colors. They do, uh, there's chemical, there's screen. Um, I don't think Fab India is competition because it's a different look altogether. What would you say is competition? You saw the prints. No, just companies are doing similar. Yeah, so tell me, do you know any companies? I, I thought of Fab India. Yeah, but their prints are more uh, florals or... And then the other cottage industries. Hmm. But Right, but most of them do traditional, not traditional, they are, they are new images, but they are a different look. 
and most of them don't work in hand printing like fab india now doesn't do much hand because they do huge quantities and they don't work in natural dyes either because again big quantities uh, there was somebody there yes it's marwadi it's like hindi it wasn't really a problem uh, i i come from north india so i am very comfortable in hindi now i speak marwadi as well what were the problems batti nahi hoti thi you know there was power for 2 hours in a day when i started working in this village so it used to be really hot now i spend between uh, one and a half months to two months in the year there with them at the time i would spend about 8 months in the year the first few years so it was hot as hell but other than that it's just been a lot of fun i've been very fortunate i've had a nice team of people to work with so it's been very nice because it's been collaborative as well i can't think of any serious problems um, i think as a woman i would be I was more careful about the way I dressed, about the way I looked. Like my daily life was different from my rural life. Now they are all the same. It's just so nice because things have changed there, and um, I look pretty much the same everywhere now. So nothing, no serious problems like that. Yes. how did i come to ah so i uh, chobundi didn't exist at the time that is something we started together and i um, i worked with uh, an ngo i told you so i worked with dastakar and i traveled all over the country and worked with different crafts people but these people i met ragunath who i work with uh, i met him at the crafts museum in delhi and i had actually you know how it is it's you know one person and through that you know another it's it's always just serendipity but i uh, there was this british ato and there was a visitor from there and he'd come to dastakar and he didn't have the money so he came to stay in my house for a few days and he was like i'm visiting i'm short of funds do you have a place to stay and he spoke about uh, they were selling unbleached t-shirts with chemical rubberized prints on them and he was saying this is so revolutionary and it's so eco friendly and then we were sitting at home and talking and saying how is this eco friendly you're doing this horrible rubber chemical print on it and saying it's eco friendly and in the 80s they were selling them for some 20 pounds a piece and stuff so anyways we got talking and we said that there's this whole thing of natural dyeing in india and we started he said acha let's do some and we just worked on it and created that for the first time and uh, that i worked with another uh, group of chipas but with these with the chobundi family i've been working since 93 and i met them serendipitously in uh, the crafts museum and then went and visited checked them out and the person who had headed this family he passed away 9 years back but the person who headed this family he was that perfect mix where he he had tradition his father used to do it but he was somebody who really wanted to experiment and that's why we could do this together his community was very uh, upset at the way he would share the techniques with us he they were you know this is community knowledge it is not your knowledge you should not be giving it away they will set up a factory hamara kya hoga type of thing but then he had that um you know he had that capacity to judge people and uh, it's worked out really well for both of us uh were you asking a yeah, question yeah. Um, so sort of coming off of that question it's more about sort of economics and potentially an ignorant question but um i'm given that in the process that you've outlined there's multiple people involved multiple yes. artists and that kind of thing so so i guess the question i have would be how do you ensure um equal sort of recognition for the individuals that are that are the artists creating sort of most of the material that you're working with as well as profit sharing and that kind of thing right. how does that how does that operate right so one way of doing it is like i'm here and i'm telling you the name of the group i have set up an instagram page a facebook page sometimes i help them with it um if i have any show in any museum anywhere their name is up with mine 
Uh, I have linked them to, I'm on the board of Dastakar, I've linked them to several, uh, to Dastakar, to other organizations. They've been to a lot of exhibitions. They are really now savvy and up with it. So, and as for the economics, it's all very transparent. Every year, I go every year in March and do a whole collection. So then we sit down, okay, what are you selling at this year? This is what this is what I'm selling at. Okay, do you think this makes sense? Okay, should we raise the prices for this? Ha, iske liye thoda bada do. No, not for this one. This one's enough. So, it's just very transparent and out there. And uh, you know, now it's an information age. And I don't think even earlier we I never hid anything from them. But especially now, it's so easy to know what anyone is selling anything at. Um, they don't need to be careful. They, they trust me implicitly in the sense before this GST, their bill books were with me and I would make the bills and they would say, I don't want to know about it, just send me the money type of thing. So that's the way I deal with it. Yes? Uh, how did you market your product initially? How, how did your first clientele come about? Right, so first clientele, like I said, was this British ATO, but they fell apart after doing one round. And then I worked with Oxfam. They wanted to, they had heard, Acha, these people have made t-shirts. Okay, so we want to make there enough people in, uh, there used to be this organization called Oxfam Bridge. And they were doing, uh, they were raising funds in India and they said there are plenty of people in India who can afford it. We don't need to just bring funding from outside the country. So will you make t-shirts? They came to us and uh, he said, you know, this people tree, which is a store and a design company in Delhi, they make t-shirts, go to them. So they went to them and they said, no, no, but these guys have done it. Go to so anyways, long and short of it is we started working together. So the first, uh, the second round that we made were for Oxfam and they put them up in these fairs, but they could not sell them. So here's another thing I've learned that I can sell what I believe in, what is my style. I can't sell something which is not my style. And it's the same, I think it's the same for everybody else. So um, then we sold that first round of stuff in People Tree. Actually, it didn't sell in those exhibitions. And then we wanted to take it forward. So for a few years, it was just in People Tree. Then this store called Either or in Pune. And now I sell online through iTokri uh, and a few other places as well. It's, that's the advantage of being like a group. Somebody designs, somebody produces, somebody retails. So different people take part, uh, take charge of different parts of the work. Yes? So um, one, I reduced my choices. Like I said, I don't have so many choices. But I know it. It's just, and I, I've been doing it for so long. It's like, uh, you know, if your mom, is, if some, somebody's cooking, they know what to put. They know how it will taste. You can, I can visualize how it's going to look this with this. So I know that in this print, this will look nice. I just know it because because of the experience. It's not some magic, it's just that I've done it enough number of times, so I know it. Yes? Right. Yeah. How do I come up with the design? I don't know. I just do. <laughs> I've never thought about this. <laughs> but it's stuff that I see around. So here's the thing. I have it in my head. When I'm walking around, I'm, I take a lot of photographs. And it's also things you see. It's things I don't even have to photograph it. But it's things I see and things I like, I enjoy. I find it quirky. I find it interesting. Uh, so it starts with the blocks and you saw that photo with many many blocks I have thousands of blocks 
it's also kismat what is lying next to which one oh yeah this is looking really nice together let me put them together in this t-shirt and make it or it can be from another uh, perspective i can sit down i usually design on the table i don't sit with a computer or sit with paper and draw it out and say iske sath ye dalungi iske sath ye dalungi but so it's sometimes it's luck of the draw sometimes it's something i've seen outside which has sparked off a thought in my head it's different for different pieces uh, every year i make new new blocks and then when then that sort of takes it like if you've chosen a shirt you know what pair of pants to wear with it because you start somewhere so you start somewhere with the new blocks and then i say okay with this with this bird i'd like some wheat or i'd like whatever whatever it is that i'd like with it and then i'll bring in the old elements and put them in and that comes together as a design it can be something i'm thinking about it could be just anything yes true yeah some of the uh, people working in the sector who are more purists they are not happy you know you are fooling around but i don't believe that you can stop anything i don't believe that we can freeze anything in time that's why I'm, i keep talking about breaking patterns but breaking pattern also makes a new pattern everything is a pattern there's nothing that is not so it's just a cycle which we go through over and over and over again so i just do what i what works for me but yeah there are people who are upset and who say this is not right what you're doing it should be traditional yes right so if i can't do it on polyester i can't do it and if they want that then they have to go somewhere else right um, it's my job to also educate the customer and say okay this is what technically this is possible also the design you want it's very good that you want this pattern i'm going to try and do it but if it doesn't work out you have to be okay to take the whatever comes out of it uh, also because i do many meters i can say okay if you i'll make it if you don't like it don't take it you take something else or don't take anything at all those are the options i can offer them depending on who it is and how hot i am that day sometimes i'll just say nahi kuch nahi i can't work with you can't do it or somebody else i'll bend over backwards if i like their work and i'll make it happen another way so yes yes absolutely that's how it happens that's what i tried to show how through so called mistakes you know like that whole post it story it is a disaster but actually not so if we, if one is not invested in that end result looking a particular way you can probably come up with something even better all the things that have gone wrong and you know i've done um, maybe a few hundred thousand meters of fabrics in all these years and maybe 25000 t-shirts not had one rejection because it's not that it's supposed to look a certain way if it doesn't look like this i'll work on it again and it'll look like something else and always the second the stuff which is worked and worked and worked uh looks better than the other stuff so then people say i want this which of course is another problem but one thing wonderful about these people that i work with never have they said we are not going to redo this so that's such a big it's such a big support that ha chalo we'll work on it again it's energy it's effort it's time it's money it's all of that but they will do it again yes how did you know that's what i've been thinking about <laughs> well uh, i i don't know i want to see any kind of production is a lot of hard work and because this things it's chaotic things do go wrong it's it's a it's a fine balance it's the relationship which i have with these people which is beyond work way beyond work um i have to say ye theek nahi hai i have to this is not on time i have to do all of that stuff as well 
So I have been thinking about reducing the quantities and going, I don't know if I want to work on more expensive fabrics or just reduce the work. I don't know what my future is. I'm really hoping somebody will come along who wants to uh, sort of take it on, take it further. Because if I, I'm happy for that to be somebody from the family who I work with, from the printers, there's one girl I'm looking at. Maybe she'll be interested, I don't know. She's still only about 17. I don't know what her plans are. Does she want to get married the traditional way? Does she want to live her own life? She doesn't know as well as yet. So once that's sorted out, but um, I'll do it for a while and then move to something else. I would like to actually make more of the single uh, pieces that I make myself. I want to do more of that. And now they are financially independent, doing well. It's OK if, if I stop, they have enough. Yes? I have a connected question. I've been wondering about what the, the mm, gender division of labor looks like and what it has looked like over the years. What has right. So it's really interesting. In communities where there is work, hard work. This cannot be done individually. It's a community activity. It needs people coming together. The more kids you have, the better off you are in this. Um, so it needs many hands to do it. In such communities, the women have always been part of the work. They are doing all of it. Uh, and you know how it is usually when there's a commercial thing, it seems like it's the men doing the work, but it's not. There's always the women who are doing it as well, sometimes with credit and sometimes without. So here, the printing part of it, the women do the printing, they do the washing. They do less of the dyeing, but everything else, they are as much. As people become uh, wealthier, it, it sometimes becomes a symbol of prosperity and success to say that my wife doesn't work. She's at home and she doesn't need to work. But that is individual choice, right? They are free to work. It's, it's up to the woman. It's up to the person. Whoops. So, um, OK. So that is the choice of the person, individual. But there is space for them to do it. This community has. Um, and because they've been working for centuries with the men, there are things like widow remarriage. There is all of that as well. Yes? Can you incorporate your thoughts and uh, what you perceive about things in your work? I do. Uh, so I really like that. But, uh, it means something to you. Do you think it will also mean something to your consumer? You can somehow incorporate their kind of something like personal touch. So you're asking me, does it mean something to them? Or are you saying, do I incorporate their thoughts? Yeah, sometimes I do, of course. I have very good friends who are very happy to give me all their thoughts and opinions and say, why don't you work on this? Why don't you work on this? So yes, I do that as well. I do. And I also, it's not like I design all the blocks myself. I have other people design the blocks as well. So uh, anyone I know, they a lot of my friends have designed blocks without being designers. You saw that process that I showed you. It's really easy. And I mean, we are not even talking about all the millions of apps that are available in the world, because that's there too, right? So it's not difficult to design. You just need to keep it. There are certain technical constraints. But if you know those, anybody can do it. It's time and energy. You have to put in time into it. Anyone else? No, because it worked so well here, I was having too much fun to bother going anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, see, when I started, I didn't have big quantities. And at the time, most printers were doing exports. And they wanted to do thousands of meters of the same exact same print. 
I didn't have a market for that. We wanted to do every piece unique. It wasn't easy to find people to work with. Uh, so when you find a good fit with people you enjoy working with, you're going to, I'm, I figure I'm going to spend so much of my time with the people I work with. I want to work with people I like, not with people I don't like. And you know, so it worked. It was a good combination and so I stuck with it. Yes? How did you adjust to the lifestyle change you encountered at the beginning? Well, it was very difficult. I had to eat very yummy food. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. No, it wasn't a problem really because uh, I had traveled a lot to rural India. Uh, what was the lifestyle change? Like I said, a little bit in the clothing, mm. vegetarian food, which I never once, like, if I'm there for a month, I never once remember that this is only vegetarian food. It's so delicious. Uh, because I didn't come from the community, the rules of the community were not, you know, I not If I had that, that would have been a different setup. But I was free to be, I actually enjoy being out of context. And being there, I could be out of context because I was this crazy person who's come from the city who's doing this kind of stuff. So, um, it wasn't a huge, and the things that were there, there are differences in the way one lives, one does things. But you learn, there's, you learn both sides. They learned and I learned too. It's not, it's not like I went there and I saved them or any of that. It was totally, we've both really gained from it. It's not like only they have gained from it. It has been huge for me as well. It's changed my life as well. I think we are done. Okay, thank you. All right. Is this working now? Fine. So I'm, thank you very much for a really interesting lecture and thank you to all of you for all the lively conversation yeah, that really you have contributed to. And yeah. nobody slept. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you haven't noticed. We're really good at it. So possibly for the last time this semester, a round of thanks to everyone who has helped us put this together starting from um, everyone in the team, the SEPT Foundation program, uh, Samir, Vishal, all the running around that people like Himanshi and Vishwa, who unfortunately is not here, but she's been doing the run around. So thank you to all of them. Thank you to Pooja, who as usual has been doing the phone calls and following up with people. And thank you to the people who've been helping us with the photography and with the videography. And to Duljibai, who made sure that technology works. Technology has not been our friend this semester, but that is what it is. Um, thank you to all of you for being here and for being a lovely audience. And see you again. Next time.